Do you ever wonder where all the bizarre claims of advanced scientific knowledge in the Quran come from? I'm not talking about the genuine science discovered by the Greeks a thousand years before the Quran was written, which is in there. I'm talking about the absurd claims that the speed of light, black holes, the Big Bang, and the Ibanez RG470 electric guitar with lockable tremolo arm were all predicted in the Quran. To know the truth of these claims, you need to know a fair bit about science and history. Unfortunately, most people don't. And that goes double for the young and quadruple for the young Muslim, aching to believe his or her culture is not based on lies and irrationality. The Quran was written 1,400 years ago, but for approximately 1,370 of those 1,400 years, nobody was making any claims concerning so-called scientific miracles in the Quran. Why not? If they are so clear, so unarguable as to be considered proof, why did these claims only begin to appear so recently? One would have thought having a book containing scientific miracles would have been a powerful advantage to any competent civilization. Yet the technology in Muslim countries today is almost exclusively purchased or copied from the non-Islamic world. One would have thought, with the aid of the Quran, a book supposedly jam-packed full of medical, biological, geological and cosmological knowledge, that Islam would have produced an Isaac Newton or an Einstein centuries before the real ones came along. After all, according to many modern Muslims, Allah handed them the answers well over a thousand years before the exam, and they still failed. For a modern Westerner, it is hard to imagine being part of a culture that is technologically backwards. We in the West have never seen Islam produce a technological marvel. Imagine it. Imagine Islam producing a hypersonic jet, or a robot as capable as those found in science fiction. Imagine how it would feel if Saudi Arabia were to plant their flag on Mars tomorrow. It's hard to imagine. Perhaps this is why it is not immediately obvious to us how Muslims must have felt, seeing infidel machines flying across their skies, listening to infidel music playing inside smaller and smaller infidel boxes. The reality of Western scientific progress only hit home probably during World War II, when England and Germany, amongst others, burst into their lands, armed to the teeth like two brawling heavyweights carrying their street fight into your home, ignoring your protests, wrecking your furniture and property, frightening your women and children, humiliating you in your own lands. When the Second World War was punctuated by the atomic explosions at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's hard to imagine any Muslim maintaining any sense of Islamic superiority. Could things get any worse? Well, yes. The State of Israel was created in the late 1940s. And I can't be sure, but I doubt that for a civilization that once led the world in science, this was good news either. It's not so much that the moon has a special place in the minds of Muslims, so much as that the moon has always had a special place in the minds of all men throughout human history. It was once synonymous with our dreams and unattainable goals. Getting there, for the people of antiquity, and even for some schmucks today, was and is an unimaginable achievement. Man landed on the moon in 1969 with Apollo 11, and left in 1972 with Apollo 17. The claims of modern science being foretold in the Quran began in 1975. It may only be a coincidence, and I am no historian, but when I think of how Western confidence would be affected by a Saudi flag on Mars, I see in the infidels dancing on the moon a moment that might have reduced Islamic self-belief to its lowest ebb. It might, just might, at some deep, perhaps subconscious level, inadvertently added insult to injury. Who else but a desperate people would try to spread the lie that Neil Armstrong converted to Islam? Desperate is the key word. The time was right. Meet Maurice Bousset. You are now looking at one of the most selfish, irresponsible assholes the world has ever produced. In 1975, Bousset a French doctor of medicine and a Catholic 
was employed as the family physician of the late King Faisal of Saudi Arabia. Bousset, perhaps because he sensed the scientific chip on Islamic shoulders, knowing there was a vast and eager potential market, wrote a book called The Bible, the Quran and Science, in which, with a few minor changes to words here and there, he was able to claim that certain verses in the Quran contained scientific knowledge that was unknown at the time the book was written and was therefore proof of the book's divine origin. The book was snapped up. Bousset became a millionaire. How many young minds has he shackled to his lamp? Maybe millions. But he probably got less than a dollar for each one. Since then, it has become an industry. It's called Bousseyism, and YouTube is swamped with videos attempting to attract new believers through this simple sleight of hand. And sadly, it works. Many young minds, ignorant of Bousset's reinterpretation of words and verses that had stood for centuries, are persuaded to accept Islam due to what they now perceive as miraculous knowledge in the Quran. An entire commission was formed to make use of this propaganda tool. Western scientists, many who profess existing religious beliefs, perhaps why they were selected, have been lured to attend scientific conferences in Islamic states with the aid of first-class plane tickets for them and their wives, rooms at the best hotels, and of course, cold hard cash. The scientists were reassured that the commission was completely neutral and in fact wel welcomed any information contradicting the Quran. By the time the scientists realized what was really happening, it was too late. They were interviewed on videotape and forced, politely, to parry endless questions, sometimes for hours, all intended to elicit just one soundbite of just a few seconds, one tired, ill-considered answer that could be used to make it seem that these Western scientists saw miraculous knowledge in the Quran. The more thoughtful mind asks if the scientists concerned actually converted to Islam, as they should if they meant what they said. Invariably, the scientist's reaction was to get back home as quickly as possible and never go near Islam again. It should be noticed that invitations to similar conferences are rarely accepted these days and never by scientists with a reputation to protect. In the sidebar is a link to an excellent article written by Daniel Golden, a staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I strongly urge you all to read it if you want to understand how Bousseyism works. If Bousset is to be believed, if he is not just some hypocritical, lying, slime-covered, vulture-faced, low-life bastard out to make a few million dollars at the cost of a few million young minds, he has seen miracles in the Quran, right? So, next question. Is he a Muslim? Did he convert to Islam? You can find many Islamic, Islamic sites that claim that he did, but that's all they do. Claim it. There's no proof. There's not even an attempt at proof. There is also a lot of anecdotal evidence that suggests that Bousset did not convert to Islam. Now think about it. You find miracles proving religion X. You would convert to religion X, right? Now, even if your conversion wasn't photographed or recorded on video, when the question was asked, as it has been by hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people, surely you would do one television interview to finally give an answer, a clear, unarguable answer. Surely you would announce your conversion publicly to settle the matter. Your integrity is being questioned, both by believers and non-believers. Pro-Islamic media and websites should have been crying out for him to say the Shahada on camera. I'm sure they would have paid him a lot of money to do it, and surely Allah would want him to do it. So why is there nothing but silence from Bousset? Doesn't he want to save all those non-Muslim souls? Doesn't he want to defend his integrity? Why is there not a single photo of him at prayer in a mosque? Who were the two witnesses required by Islamic ritual if he said the Shahada? What are their names? Where are they? Why haven't they been interviewed? The answers are easy if you're honest. And speaking of names, what is Maurice Bousset's Muslim name? He's supposed to have one. After hours of searching, I have not found one Islamic site that gives Maurice Bousset's Islamic name. Cat Stevens became Yusuf Islam. 
Cassius Clay publicly became Muhammad Ali. What did Maurice Bousset become? I've got a name for him. Wanker. <laughs>